Go ahead and start. Give All right. Time. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it is my pleasure today to introduce Professor Richard Rico Ignace to the HO Colloquia. Rico earned a master in physics uh, and a PhD in astronomy, both from University of Wyoming at Madison, uh, the latter, the PhD in uh, 1996. Uh, his doctorate thesis was uh, under the supervision of famed Professor Joe Cassinelli. And it was arguably, from what Rico told me, the first exploration of the use of uh, Hanley Fett polarization diagnostic in stellar winds. And pretty much to these days, he's pretty much a loner in this business. <laughs> he then uh, went on on a postdoc at the University of Glasgow, working with another fame fellow, the late John Brown. And uh, there he also had a chance of meeting our Scott McIntosh, who was instead working on his doctorate thesis at the time, I presume. So when he came back in the US, he spent a few years as visiting professor at the University of Iowa. And finally, in 2003, he moved to East Tennessee State University, where he's now a professor. His main topics of research are massive stars and circumstellar media, such as winds and disks, which he studies over the full spectrum of radiation from X-rays to radio. And all of these sprinkled with polarization, which is uh, really you know, a powerful feature for uh, uh, studying uh, these objects. And uh, so today he's going uh, to talk us about uh, some adventures in X-ray studies of massive stars. Rico, off to you. Thank you, Roberto. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to get my presentation up here. Give me one second. People can see this okay? Yep. yep. Fantastic. Okay. The other thing I'm going to do, I apologize, but I'm going to go incognito because uh, my Mac kind of gets hot for some reason on these kinds of sessions, despite being new. So I just want to thank everyone. I know this is a non-standard day for uh, presentations like this. Thank you for so many of you um, um, coming today. Also, I'm just having a great time here in Boulder. It's my first time uh, visiting Roberto and talking about the Hanley effect and, and polarization topics. Uh, so uh, the hospitality of everyone has been Fantastic. Uh, but today, what I wanted to do is just kind of talk about my, my titles a little bit. Massive stars in the upper left. Sounds like we are having any sound issues. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Is anyone there? Okay. Now, yes. I don't know what that was. Yeah, there was uh, some okay. uh, garbling going uh, on. But I, I mostly oh. work in the area of circumstellar media, stellar winds, discs, that sort of thing. And the reason I called it adventures is that I've actually been doing this for a chunk of time now. And, uh, I really got into X-rays of massive stars in the context of the evolved Wolf Ray stars a long time ago. I was looking at some existing data sets for um, X-ray fluxes, luminosity estimates for uh, from the ROSAT, and uh, it was right at the time that XMM and Newton and Chandra were being launched. And uh, I wanted to just show this expression over here, because it really does contain many of the features that are being explored and trying to be understood in relation to massive star x-rays. Massive stars aren't, aren't really supposed to be x-ray sources, They're not really coronal sources or weren't expected to be. About 10% of massive stars are now known to be magnetic, but they're often quite stable fossil-like dipole magnetic fields as opposed to flaring activity. Um, and so the candidates, the preferred candidate for explaining x-rays, aside from being binaries, uh, where stellar winds can crash at highly supersonic speeds, make shocks, and produce X-rays. Um, even in single stars, the the wind driving by spectral lines is subject to instabilities and just naturally of its own makes shocks. And since the wind speeds are of the order of thousand kilometers per second and above, you get some uh, you get strong shocks in quite high temperatures up at a million Kelvin. And, and above. Well, some of the features that are appearing in here are the things that we would like to understand about X-rays and be able to use it to probe the wind structure, 
the driving of the winds and the nature of these shocks and things. Um, of course, we want to know things like X-ray luminosity. Isn't for a lot of massive stars, it's about one part in 10 million of the bulk metric luminosity. This is going to depend on features of the wind, like the mass loss rate. And the wind speed is going to set the strength of the shock and the temperature. Temperature, I guess. There's a filling factor that 10 to the minus 7 is kind of puny compared to all the luminosity produced by the stellar photosphere. So we think these are winds that are 30,000 Kelvin, 20,000, whatever the case may be, kind of at the stellar photospheric temperature. And there's just a, a small fraction of the wind is being heated to X ray temperatures. Um, the wolf ray winds are very dense, and so there's photo absorption, through case shell um, absorption. Um, and that kind of appears in this expression here. There's cooling physics by uh, lines. And then there's stuff here, mean molecular weights. And in the case of wolf ray stars, they're hydrogen poor, helium rich, they come in nitrogen and carbon rich varieties. And the non solar metals, non solar metallicity, has an influence on the cooling. And so, really, a lot of the features just shows up as like one expression. And that was where. Working on to try to get an understanding for the scaling of X-ray luminosities and the distinctions that are seen between the, the nitrogen-rich, which are detected often, and the carbon-rich, which are often not particularly good X-ray sources. So let's, let's come back. So what, what I'm going to do is this is kind of a motivation. I'm sure many people in, in the audience are familiar with the importance of massive stars, their role in cosmic history. All of our different areas have these roles. And in the massive star case, you know, the, globe, the supernovae, behind black holes, the neutron stars, very luminous. They basically, they churn up the medium, right? Ionizing and energy. Uh, interjecting energy and momentum into the interstellar medium and things like this. Now, what I like to do is I like to think in terms of diagnostics. So I'm not, not going to take like a star and try to dissect this one star, some sort of exemplar. I'm not even necessarily going to try and describe like the class of stars, O stars, B stars, and Wolf Ray stars, sort of unify what's going on. Um, instead, I, I kind of enjoy like, you know, here's here's what we get. What do we, how, how do we know the things that we claim to know? This is what I kind of like to think about and create diagnostics. You give me a bunch of fluxes, I'll know the distances. What are the trends with these X-ray luminosities? What's governing that? Or, spectral x-ray spectral line profiles and things like that so that's kind of where i'm headed just to let everyone know but as i said I'm, I'm i'm going to dwell around here in the upper left of the hr diagram and uh these are where you have the radiatively driven winds um and they are more or less x-ray sources and the b stars can be actually quite faint x-ray sources you get the later types we know that they have mass loss we observe these UV type of lines, and you also see emission lines in the in the optical for the stronger wind cases, higher mass loss rates. Uh, Wolf ray winds are an example, but in the UV, uh, you get these P signaling lines: blue shifted absorption, red shifted emission, telltale sign of a wind outflow. In fact, if you were to reverse this feature about uh, the color break here. You would have an inverse P signaling that would be infall. So uh, the regular P signaling is outflow. And the strength of the line relates to things like the mass loss rate. There are other annoying features that it relates to, like ion fraction and stuff that can be hard to get to, but nonetheless. And then here's here's a picture. It's the observers at the bottom, and this is where the blue shifted velocities are. And you've got gas between you and the star moving with a range of speeds that's where you get the absorption from on the blue shifts and then you get emission from the whole rest of the volume red shift through blue shift and that adds in and here's a little cartoon just describing that deconstruction where if you look over here at the lower right you get this sort of gaussian like shape it's not truly a gaussian but just a bell curve like shape for the emission spans blue shifts to red shifts only blue shifted absorption if you have redshifted absorption, you might have infall, you might have rotation, those kinds of things, but your standard P signaling line looks like this. And when you when you superimpose the two, this is what you get. So we have winds, we know some things about mass loss rates and, and terminal speeds. Terminal speed is one of the easier things to get. 
mass loss rates, it's a lot more challenging for a variety of reasons. But on top of that, we know that the winds are structured. They, they, have, they have something going on in them. This is uh, IUE data. In this case, a wolf ray star, a wolf ray A star. And uh, in this line here, which is a, a P signaling line, what you see over the course of like two weeks from the IUE mega campaign some well, 25 years ago now, uh, this is a what's called a dynamic spectrum. And what you do is every time you have a spectrum, uh, you take the whole data set, you make an average, and each individual spectrum you subtract from that average. So you get some enhancements in emissions, some deficits or enhancements in absorptions, whatever the case may be. But what you see is a variety of changing effects in the line profiles. It's exactly what we expect, um, generally speaking. Of course, there can be different sources to that. An interesting study that's somewhat more recent, this one is of Zeta Pop, a heavily well-studied star. This is carbon-4 over here, a doublet. This is uh, nitrogen-4, an excited line, a singlet, and they both have some absorption, and carbon-4 is kind of complicated. You can see two, two sets of the patterns here. And uh, what these authors did is they created a splice. They basically said, we have trouble tracing structure down to the photosphere. It's like this gap here. Does the structure disappear at, at mid-speeds or not? And for this nitrogen-4 line, it's expected that uh, you get a good opacity all the way down to the photosphere. So uh, these authors had a way of, like, trimming this absorption in the portion of the dynamic spectrum for the low velocities, trimming here for the high high velocities, and putting the two together, literally splicing them together, and that's where it happens. And uh, they're saying that you can see structure all the way from the photosphere out to terminal speed, which is kind of cool. There's a bunch of it. All right. Supersonic flow, evidence for structure, we're going to make some x-rays. And we know that there are many sources of X-rays, hot bubbles in the ISM, the sun's a source of X-rays, massive stars are a source of X-rays as well. We think it's connected to, to the, the formation of structure in the winds. Now, the IUA data is, is kind of probably seeing co-rotating interaction regions, some variety. So it's like more globally organized kinds of structure, perhaps, uh, but to make the structure at all kinds of levels. So. So what are some of the ways of making hot gas in massive stars? I mentioned the colliding winds. That's a great way. We know that pretty much every massive star is uh, born in a binary. Statistically speaking, it's like 100%. Things happen in, in that space. Of course, some, one, one star is going to blow up first, you know, runaways and things like that. But, um, but there are, you can have two wind collisions and get some nice x-rays from that. I'll, I'll mention that. Embedded wind shocks. So, what uh, arises from the wind driving, the rate of driving itself of the wind. Um, I have some things to say about that. Co-rotating interaction regions. You know, there's no real model for this right now, um, but we think the features are there, but understanding how that globally organized structure might uh, contribute as an X-ray source uh, still has to be investigated further. And then, as I mentioned, there are magnetic stars, about 10% of massive stars will last. And uh, they can have some quite strong fields, and you're still driving wind. So what happens is you kind of get what I call self-wind collision. You get a flow that's being channeled by the uh, magnetic field lines and slams into itself farther out in the magnetic closed loops. Uh, let me say, I have something quick maybe to say something about that. We begin with uh, some colliding winds. Um, a little explored area is B plus B binaries. A little odd. Um, more common, uh, more dramatic systems involve maybe an O star and a Wolf Ray star, sometimes a couple of O stars. But as it turned out, <clears throat> I, I stumbled upon a list of a whole bunch of eclipse, like a dozen and a half of. Uh, Double line spectroscopic eclipsing B binaries. Amazing list. And most of the binaries were like exact duplicates. Here's AHSEP and CWSEP that I and collaborators managed to get some uh, chandra time to observe. And over here is a depiction of them with the black dot being the center of mass and the magenta one being an estimate for where the stagnation uh, uh, point 
would be for the wind collision. So I'm just lifting some stuff out of the paper. I don't expect you to, to read all these things, just that all four of them are, are nearly identical stars, nearly the same temperature sizes and everything. What I did was I put in a red dashed line for the very largest component, which is age set. Okay. So what I have here are, are, are almost four identical stars. Yeah, this one's a little smaller over in the lower right. Almost four identical stars, very similar in masses, very similar in their orbital properties, and they're eclipsing. I mean, it's like the ideal controlled experiment. The only thing is that the B stars don't have particularly strong mass loss rates, and so it was interesting to ask the question, do we expect to see hard emission from these objects? And so <laughs> um, we have some follow-up data for AHSEP, but here are two Chandra images of AHSEP on the left, CW set on the right. Remember, it's like a pair of twins. Almost everything's the same. And we detect one, and we fail to detect the other, like by an order of magnitude uh, smaller count rate. That's weird. Uh, still not sure we totally understand that. But um, nonetheless, the, uh, the work progresses. I just want to pop out of here and show you a couple videos. Give me a second. Can everyone see this coming up? Do you see a video? Anyone? We see the, the window, yeah, with the graph, so you haven't clicked on the video yet, right? That's right, but you can <clears throat> see the frame. Okay, that's fine. Uh, what I'm gonna do yeah, is, you know. oh, oh, sorry. It's not what I wanted to do. Uh, I'm going to click one here for AHSEP. This is a video from a hydrodynamic simulation from Chris Russell. Chris Russell does a, a lot of this sort of thing. And it's not playing. So let me go back and try the other one. Hmm. All right. I'm having trouble getting it to play. I'm sorry. So uh, let me just go back to this one as a still frame. What he's done is... He has created a series of movies to display in the upper left uh, density. This is a top-down view, and the, the black circles are the stars. Uh, velocity field is over in the lower left. The upper right is uh, x-ray temperature, and you can see you get kind of the spirally shape. And then down below is x-ray x -ray emission. So it's really well confined by these two winds. You get this wind interaction, and you can see in the upper left the uh, uh, high density there. And what I was trying to show you is that because we see these as eclipsing systems, don't know why it won't play. I thought we tested this before, and it played just fine. So I'm sorry. Let me see if I simply reload it. Oh, here we go. So these are the simulations. Over on the left is column density, and over on the right is X-ray flux. And because we're seeing them edge on, um, you know, we get these eclipsing effects. And so we don't have, we've not measured a light curve. What our data set was, was simply to see if there was significant hardness in the spectrum. It was just kind of a yes, no question. Instead, we kind of ended up with a different issue, like one is on and one is off, and that was not expected at all. But, um, but it's these kind of simulations that will help us move forward to try to uh, understand these systems better. And uh, it's really just kind of fun to watch here. So, all right, I'm going to pop out of there and come back to the talk. We still good? Everyone can see the frames here? Or the slides? Yes. yes. Roberto? Yep. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so why do we have a non-detection? It now seems that with an improved distance estimate, maybe CW CEP is a little farther away and was just below our detection threshold. So maybe there's no, there might not be any huge mystery, uh, but we definitely need a follow-up. Switching gears just a little bit, I mentioned something about uh, magnetic systems. Um, there are stars right of the number of magnetic mass loss. Um, 
Yeah, sorry, Riho, you're coming garbled again. I think that the internet connection is pretty unstable from the guest network, unfortunately. Can you repeat what uh, you were describing in this slide? It's an incredibly strong field. And here's this illustration of the gray. Of the, the self sliding wind streams from the opposite uh, hemispheres, channeled by the magnetism, very strong magnetic fields. And makes them both X rays kind of in a not necessarily disk, it's not actually symmetric, it's some sort of edge zone like that. Then up here, up here. No, it's, it's, it's nearly impossible to, to understand. Um, they're suggesting that uh, there should be a phone number that you can use for the audio if you can use your phone instead and mute your computer because it looks like uh, the, the, we cannot keep up with uh, both uh, visual and um, audio with this connection, unfortunately. It should be a phone number. Cheryl, can you confirm? Yeah, yes. So, Rico, if you go to uh, the invite yeah. and your calendar <clears throat> and you click on that, it'll expand and there'll be a phone number. Let me, I can just put it in the chat window right here. What should I do with go. that? It's not a clickable thing. Oh, so so turn off your computer gotcha. audio. Yeah, I'll call that. And then call in from the from the desk phone right there in your office, the number that I just chatted. Okay. And see if that will work. Do I have to dial a number to get out of the UCAR system? Uh, yeah, seven. Seven one. Give me a second, dialing it up. Oh. Just a second, seven, one, and then dial. Oh, it kind of wants a pin. <laughs> it wants a pin, I'll just do one, uh, uh wait a minute wait a minute you want me to dial seven one four one nine seven four six all that yeah. stuff yeah all right yes. seven one four one nine give me a second okay somebody's mentioned that maybe it's a problem with my laptop it's dialing am i in I haven't seen it yet. I need the meeting pin. Uh, 302 576 885 pound. I'm sorry, I think I missed hit something. Could you could you repeat yeah. it again? 302 five seven six eight eight five pound says i'm muted so i think i'm in yes i see you now on the phone and then right then mute your computer and then talk through the phone so you should be able to do that in speaker phone mode so you don't have to hold it up can you figure that out yeah Rico, we're not hearing you on the phone. Yeah, your phone is still showing up as muted. Maybe he can't hear us. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. 
Can you hear me when I'm on the phone? Because I can't. No, hear I think we're hearing you through the computer. I know I had to turn it on so I could talk to you. But we didn't hear you through the phone. You have to un. But now it's coming with an echo, so that means that the phone also is working. But it still looks muted. Can the meeting host unmute the phone no. account? Oh, it's not letting, I can't touch the phone. Roberto, can you wander over to his office? Yeah, let me do that. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for your patience. It's funny, this this one person is actually in Boulder when we're having the most trouble. I, I don't think the phone's working. I should just proceed with this. Is that okay? Hello? Go ahead. Sorry. It, it wasn't muted. So I think I'll just crank along here. Uh, I think I'll skip that one. Let me go to um, talking about the embedded winds, uh, wind shocks, because that seems to be one of the most common ubiquitous features of of massive star winds. They They show structure. They show hot hot gas as well often x-ray sources um one of the interesting look, things that uh it hello? looks like you're not presenting uh oh just a second well it's been a real adventure How, can you see this <laughs> yes okay. okay now we see it so this is an XMM spectrum of a Wolf Ray star of the nitrogen rich variety. And one of the interesting things is that it should be oxygen poor and we know that. And sure enough, there are no oxygen lines in this RGS spectrum uh, of this Wolf Ray star, which is kind of cool. So the oxygen, uh, helium-like oxygen at 22, hydrogen-like at 19 are just, just absent. Nitrogen lines are strong. Um, but then we also, I was part of a group that got uh, some Chandra data, and I just must say, I've been able to participate in so now I need to be able to participate in these kinds of study. And so you can see that there's a change here in the wavelength span. RGS is a little bit on the softer side. Chandra goes to shorter wavelengths, but uh, has lost sensitivity down at the short. ones um, and uh, highlighting on a small section here some helium like triplets so i'll be coming back to that again aluminum magnesium we still get triplet system uh, and then switching objects both of these are w or six switching objects to zeta pup now going back to an o star i was part of a group that got a total of 800 kiloseconds of chandra time to observe this um sort of special and iconic O4F supergiant. I don't know what other symbols it has going on with it. This portion over here has been expanded because it's getting really faint. Um, but just a beautiful spectrum of, uh, there's oxygen, eight again, hydrogen-like, but you got a bunch of helium-like triplets in here and just a very rich spectrum. So it's been tremendous fun working on that. So I've shown a couple of spectrums. I'm going to come back to those. Let me just remind everyone about this idea of structured winds. This is from a 1D hydro model showing, <clears throat> excuse me, density variations through a wind during a snapshot of that simulation. And in the red over here are the velocity. And you can see these very sharp discontinuous jumps here. And so we've got all these shocks and all this structure. We don't think they're in shells. We think it's much more stochastic. Just simulation is 1D. And so 
the point is you do expect a distributed podcast throughout the wind. And And uh, one of the amazing things, let's see, one of the amazing things about this Zeta Pups uh, spectrum here is that by and large, one expects the cooling to be dominated by lines. In fact, all this little stuff down here at low signal level is probably just a mishmash of a whole bunch of lines creating a pseudo continuum. But in this expanded part, in particular, really from about nine angstroms shortward, but, in, but this expanded part here, just you get fewer lines, and yet we have a continuum. And this, this continuum may actually be run strong. We actually think it's run strong. And so because it's optically thin, we don't expect much photoabsorption at such short wavelengths. Uh, the photoabsorption capacity is just dropping like a rock towards these short wavelengths. There is an opportunity to use. Use the continuum to back out a temperature distribution. Now, you can do that with lines. You would like to do it with lines, but this is sort of independent from uh, the, the uh, thermal burn straw one. So there's some figures here. I'm not going to go into detail, but basically, if you have some sort of power law distribution and temperature, a differential emission measure, just shown down here at the lower right, here with the minus seven thirds power, then you use that as input, and you have no, you don't care about the absorption. So you just see everything that's there, the shortest wavelengths, all the X-ray photons escape, and they make it through the ISM by and large. Um, you know, again, at the softer energies, the, the ISM. It's going to be strongly absorbing all these massive stars on the galactic plane. So that's a problem at the soft, but the hard, you're basically getting all those photons. Then what you expect is a SED or spectral energy distribution. Um, it's going to be like power law. Now, if this were a straight power law forever, you would get a straight power law on your spectrum, but there's going to be a turnover. And that turnover signified by this gamma function here, uh, not the mathematical gamma function, but by this parameter gamma, which depends on slope and you know, give you a turnover in the shape in these red curves to the upper right. There's some different examples. Um, you have the opportunity, perhaps, to infer a distribution of temperature for the global wind and to get the maximum temperature, because where the turnover occurs will depend on that max. And uh, just with our data set, you got to have a good swath of wavelengths for this to work, because when you do this, uh, do this, um, the, the integration to get the new spectral energy Distribution is kind of slowly varying, so you got to have a chunk of wavelengths. And I've got a lot of energy here, but you got to have a chunk of wavelengths to get it. Um, and so, what we found, what we inferred, was a maximum temperature of about 12 million Kelvin, and that requires velocity jumps for strong shocks of nearly a thousand kilometers per second. And this wind has like a 2,500 kilometer per second maximum speed, so there's plenty of plenty of opportunity to hit this 200. So that was neat. The other thing that's important for these spectra at high resolution provided by XMM and Chandra uh, is the opportunity to analyze the spectral line shapes. Um, when you're doing the spectral lines, you get two kinds of information. You get total flux, but you also get the profile shape when you have sufficient resolution. Unfortunately for Chandra and the RGS, uh, these winds are very broad, and so you can't actually resolve the lines. But one of the interesting things uh, that came out immediately from the early data, like around 2001, things like that, was that the lines were quite asymmetric, or some stars, I should rephrase that, they can be asymmetric, with blue shifted peak emission and depressed red shifted emission. This can be easily understood in expanding wind. What I have here is a gray circle for a star. In, in constant expansion, I've got like these ISO velocity zones. So everything on this cone to the right is going to show up at some frequency in the profile at a blue shift because it's coming towards the observer to the far right. And everything on the back cone shows up at the opposite location from line center on the red shift. Okay. 
But in between, because you have, if you have, if you have a sufficiently dense wind, you're going to have some absorption to all the points on the near cone. But the back cone, you've got some intervening wind that you have that the X-rays have to fight through. So you express expect to um, depress the redshifted X-ray emission more than the blue shifted. And, and let me just walk through some example model line profiles, different gamma, by the way. It must be one of my favorite Greek letters, but that's okay. Um, you know, if you just had this, if you just had this picture here, you actually get kind of a flat type, uh, uh, flat top uh, line, line shape, emission line profile, except for occultation. So what's, what's shown here is this tau is the degree of absorption of, by the wind. And even when there's no optical depth, you still don't get a flat top because you got some X-ray gas right behind the star, and so you cut it out. Okay. But as you increase the Enrico, I don't know if uh, your presentation is is frozen because it's not, it doesn't look like it's advancing. I'm still seeing analysis of continuum emission slide. As you increase the optical depth, you can see that you press okay. the red side quicker than the blue side, and you end up with over here on the right this kind of almost triangular shape. We have peak way over here. This isn't very realistic because real winds are accelerating. They velocity changes. It's not constant expansion. And here's a uh, a suite of such profiles. These bottom ones are more constant expansion. Something formed really far out and looks kind of like what I was showing before. But when you form deeper in, the vertical here is where the X-rays start relative to our star, so all the way down to the star. Maybe some sort of inner boundary to the X-rays far out. It's just a parameter study. And then these parameters over across the top are described down here, but something having to do with what velocity law are we talking about? And the Q has to do with that filling factor, just where's the hot gas located? Close to the star, far from the star, in, in between. So playing games with that, one thing that seems clear, you always get blue shifted emission and depressed red shifted emission if you have some wind absorption, enough wind absorption. Um, but you know, when you're an observer, I mean, you can be fitting profiles, that's great, um, but depending on the wind speeds and the quality of your data and things like that, you might wanna have some moments. What kind of moments do we have? Well, you may be fitting your profiles with Gaussians or something like this. Maybe you're gonna get some widths, line widths, and maybe you're going to get where is the peak located relative to line center. So these numbers here are relative to the terminal speed. That's why they have no units. So whatever the wind speed is, which is largely known, um, I'm going to have a blue shifted peak. That's why it's negative. I'm going to have some kind of line width. I have line width if there's no wind absorption, right? I have a line width that changes when there is wind absorption. So what I've done here in these two left panels is plot these kinds of interesting measures of lines um, and against the wind optical depth. Well, which line? It doesn't matter which line. You, you pick the line, and at that wavelength, there's some photo absorption optical depth. Different wavelength, different optical depth. So that's okay. So we kind of captured everything in these figures. And sure enough, as the, as the optical depth increases, you expect the line profile to be increasingly blue shifted for its peak. But as it turns out, you also expect it to get wider and wider. And I think you can see that here as these profiles, as the peak goes to the left, that's higher optical depth. And then it also appears to be wider as well. And but of course, you don't know optical depth. That's probably one of the things you want to get out of it. So maybe you can plot the peak versus full with the tap max and try to do something to figure out these dots here are each a different optical depth level. Over here in the lower right is just kind of fun. I was just kind of showing where the half max points are on the red wing and the half max points fall on the blue wing, where the pair of dots going from bottom to top is the increasing wavelength, so you can kind of see it. All right. But that turns out not to be the entire story, and I, I know we've... We had some technical difficulties, so I am being mindful of the time. Um, the other thing that happens is that it turns out with all that structure, you may have porosity. Now, one has to be a little careful here. We have the volume filling factor for where the hot gas is. But at the same time, this may or may not be correlated 
with the cool absorbing gas. So it's a two component picture. And if those clumps are individually optically thick, then you kind of care about the space in between. And so you have a mean free path argument. What's displayed at the top is a wind showing two varieties of clumps, if you will. The cool clumps, the ones that are going to absorb the x-rays. The x-rays are trying to fight to get it out. Along the top row are spherical clumps, so bobs. And along the bottom are more like pancakes. Um, and maybe you would get that from uh, shocks that are fragmented. You don't have sh a shock that's a full, coherently organized shell. It breaks up into little segments. right? And you can see as you have more and more clumping, as you look off to the right, you start to see some white uh, points in between this mismatch of structure. That sounds like maybe the x-rays could escape more easily through there. And that would check, uh, that would alter the line shape. So let's just ignore this right plot over here. Let's look at the left one. Here I'm just showing, just with a simple constant velocity, because I, I like it, you tend to get a flat top. Abs deviation from flat top means some, there's something going on. It may be occultation, it may be absorption. But in this case, what I did was I took for the red one, just a highly absorbed line profile. And if I allow for this porosity, this mean free path business where you actually have the um, take into account the structure flow in this way, um, you can see that with um, a, a longer mean free path, the profile is starting to crawl back up to just where you have the effects of occultation, right? So this can also influence the line shape. In fact, there's, there's a whole bunch of things that it might, and so I just wanted to display, because I'm, in, I'm into the diagnostics. We get a line profile, not just one, we get a whole spectrum of them, right? Uh, and you can try to answer some questions like, um, let's take this one, where's the onset of the x-rays? Or above, maybe the opacity is not constant throughout the wind. There's some evidence in the case of Zeta Pup, a spectrum that I showed that has some of the best data of all stars for uh, X-rays from their stellar winds. Um, it does not. Appear, it appears that that photo absorption changes with radius, and that has maybe something to do with recombination of helium. There's an ion change in a, in a major, important, abundant element. Um, and then this one, this filling factor, just where this is just a hard change, like X-rays are above, beyond two R star. But this was like, well, the X-rays are kind of forming in the sort of intermediate zone of the wind, of the wind acceleration. Some close, some far, maybe in between. So you can play these games and get all these different profile shapes. But notice once again that everything will be blue shifted. Anything that has photo absorption, you're definitely going to get a blue shifted peak. That tends to be a robust result. And the reason I kind of went through that is let me go back to Wolf Ray 6. Um, for the Chandra data, there's high enough resolution, the wind is fast enough at about 1,500 kilometers per second that you can actually resolve some lines. Here's a magnesium 2 line profile. Here's a couple of iron lines. And with several lines um, that have been resolved, they show this skew to the blue really well. And the peaks are kind of close to the blue edge, right? Pretty sharp drop here, um, signifying like the highest speed. And you kind of see it over and over. And the lead author, David, here referred to these as fin shapes, shark fins. Well, um, actually, the one of the constant examples, this kind of thing, or this kind of thing actually ends up being an adequate uh, fitting, uh, fitting profile for the data. And here are some examples where this parameter Q is that volume filling factor so that you can get different degrees of, 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 of asymmetry in the line. And like all of the lines are basically fit by this style. That basic success suggests strongly, at least in the case of this Wolf Ray A star, which we know is very dense. Wolf ray winds are incredibly dense, photo absorption incredibly strong, but the X-rays seem to be either emerging from the terminal wind flow, they may be distributed, uh, and it's only when you're far enough away that the X-rays can escape, or they're only formed far away, right? 
It's one of those two possibilities. But if they're formed far away, it's not obvious you would get the fin shape. This fin shape suggests that you actually do have distributed x-rays. Well, it seems to suggest. So that's neat. Hey, I, I like doing theory and diagnostics and things like this. I was really excited when something so simple appeared to actually be able to match data. Um, let's see. Let me talk about this as well. Um, Called bow shocks. So if you do have all this structure and you do have these shocks, you might expect that some of the absorption and the X-ray production could be correlated. There's always the question of what level of complexity does the data does the data demand? But nowadays, we do understand that we do have clumps in structure, and yet the space between the clumps is not a vacuum. Some time ago, um, my collaborators and I uh, ran a different set of hydrodynamic simulations with essentially like round obstacles signifying these strong clumps, which is not, you know, there's some uh, lack of realism here, like these, these could be destroyed. But if you, just, if you just start from that point and you have a hypersonic flow and these clumps are small, so the wind looks like it's plane parallel for, um, at this scale, then you form these bow shocks. Bow shocks are things you get all over the place in astronomy. You get them, for example, in colliding winds. One will, one wind tends to be stronger than the other, and it forms a bow shock about the other star. But this is, this is a wind, an interclump wind, flowing over a denser clump, and you get a bow shock. And uh, this is showing the streamline flow from top to bottom in the left, density, temperature, and then the emission measure. And that's something we care about for. Uh, for evaluating x-rays and line profiles and things. And then this plot over on the right is also throwing in some velocity vectors to show how you get uh, slower flow post-shock and then it accelerates behind the clump. One of the interesting things, uh, outcomes from this, is the idea that you get a power law temperature distribution for the emission measure, or the emission measures of power law and temperature. That was one of those things that we were testing with the tremendously amazing data coming from Zeta Puff from Chandra with the continuum. In other words, this sort of became an input and it seemed to do pretty well. What you would like to do then is you would like to model the line profiles. Uh, the problem is that these uh, hydrodynamic simulations for the clumps, they weren't evolving the clump. We weren't tracking the clump through the wind or anything like that. Essentially, it was a snapshot, a kind of stationary situation. But nonetheless, you could take the result and you could contrive a way of thinking about distributing these clumps within the wind velocity um, uh, development, the acceleration of the wind itself. They're called uh, velocity laws that typically come out of uh, the line driving uh, physics that you start at low speed and you rise up to uh, a high speed. And a couple of possibilities that we explored is what is the wind velocity or what is the velocity law of these clumps? So the idea is you're looking for a velocity jump. You're looking for a shock, something different between the inner clump wind and the clump flow itself. The clumps aren't just going to sit still in space. They're being driven out as well. Maybe, maybe they share the same terminal speed, but they travel a more shallow path. Or maybe they all, all the clumps and the gas in between the clumps follow the same shape, but they have different terminal speeds. There's different possibilities here. If you play games with that, you can create some simulated spectra that maybe you can test against data. But, but that's pretty tough. So um, there are, there's, there's interstellar absorption, wind absorption, a number of things that can affect uh, the broader SEDs, like the hardness ratio of the X-rays things like that. It's more interesting might be the line profiles. So basically, um, here's some uh, examples of what kind of line profiles you get from just a single clump. Just isolate an individual clump, that's all you got, and you got this cool bow shock. What kind of line profiles do you get? Well, over on the left is placing the clump at different locations around the star from the observer. And you tend to get these double horned, uh, optically thin emission lines from one clump. You can probably tell where this is going. You're going to have an ensemble of clumps, right? 
But uh, this is what you get at different uh, places around the star, um, say at a fixed radius and just change the theta. But over on the right is something that's pretty interesting is that what if you take different temperature um, cuts of the bow shock? After all, we have all kinds of different lines. We have hydrogen-like oxygen. We have helium-like magnesium. Those all form at different kinds of temperatures. And so their contributions would look different. In, in this example here, I've kind of took cuts at the temperatures indicated from like 0.1 million Kelvin up to about three, three Kelvin. And over, I'm reminding people of the velocity field over here in the, in the upper right in the inset, you know, the hot gas is going to be coming from over here and then spreading out around and then you pick up the speed. This particular clump is located in the plane of the sky with respect to the observer. So even though the downstream uh, portion is picking up high speed, the problem is it's almost vertical with respect to the observer. So it's a little Doppler shift. So the soft stuff ends up a little narrow in this example and you get broader contribution from the hot gas. And so here it is exactly as I suggested. We're gonna throw a bunch of clumps together, randomly sprinkle them around in the wind, increasing numbers. We don't see stuff like this. Uh, we see stuff more like this. Sure enough, even with some photo absorption, you still get the blue shifted peak and you get some, some stranger shape. So test this, testing as this idea um, is gonna take a little bit higher signal to noise data, even than the Zeta pup data does has, but nonetheless, uh, trying to develop diagnostics to understand, you know, ways you can figure out this structure and where things are located as well. The, the last thing I'll just mention uh, uh, briefly is uh, F to I ratios. Uh, this is a, a well-known tool um, in a variety of applications and disciplines from cool stars to hot stars. Here, illustrating uh, the uh, energy level diagram associated with oxygen seven, the helium-like oxygen. In cool stars, often the F di ratio, uh, uh, you get different ratios because of uh, collisional excitation. You can depopulate a level and change the emission line ratio of the forbidden and the inter intercombination component of this three of this triplet um, uh, emission line. In the case of massive stars, which are ultraviolet bright, instead of collisions, um, the wind is lower density, and so you're not going to have the collisional uh, pumping, but instead um, you have a lot of UV flux, and you can depopulate the F component and lower its emission relative to the I component, the inner combination, uh, by depopulating it through uh, UV radiation. So. Um, just a table that's not really great resolution, but all I wanted to point out is all kinds of helium triplets that we see in uh, lots of hot star spectra, such as Zeta Pup, Wolf Ray, uh, WR6. Um, and then here are some wavelengths for the UV pumping lines, or I'm sorry, the UV pumping wavelengths. Okay, so they're spread through the UV into the FUV. And I, I've been using WR6 and Zeta Pup as examples because they really have the best, pretty much the best data sets for um, an O star and a Wolf Ray A star. And one thing that's really interesting is that here in WR6, here's the F component. The I component's here. This is actually, it's kind of weak, but it's got kind of a blue shifted emission there. And then here's the R, the resonance component. Resonance intercombination forbidden. And Zeta Pup, notice how strikingly different it is. This is the intercombination line. It's got this skew because it has wind absorption and the, the F line is largely lacking. So the red is a, is a fit to the triplets for the Wolf Ray star. And when you overlay it on the O star, okay, uh, F is depressed and the I component is enhanced. What's going on? Well, remember I said that the uh, WR6 case we think that the X-rays are forming in the terminal speed wind. That's far from the uh, far from the star itself. So there's no UV pumping way out there. The the ultraviolet radiation is just far too dilute. But in Zeta Pup, this suggests that the X-rays are coming from deep in the wind because they're just much less wind absorption overall. All right, and I'll pretty much end on this and take some questions. But 
One of the interesting things about the FIR business is that right now this often comes down to line ratios, F to I, in terms of the total line flux. You can see the capacity to actually measure, um, resolve the lines, Lafray, not as great, Zeta Pop, a lot better data set and small noise, um, more bins, if you will, but it often comes down to the total line flux. But in the future, sort of next gen X ray telescopes, the other expectation is not only do you have different areas, but you actually have different shapes. The, the R, F, and I components have different shapes because you are differentially pumping the F line, depopulating it in preference to the I, I line um, in a velocity dependent way. And that will naturally speak to the profile shape. So in the future, one hopes to be able to use this in a brand new way to get information about the distribution of hot gas and massive star winds and the action about where the shocks are produced. All right, and I'm going to stop there, pop out, um, and take questions, I guess. I'm sorry for all the difficulties there. Hello? Hello, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you no, know, a simple question is uh, how is the uh, polarization going to complete or aid these, uh, these diagnostics? I mean, uh, how much more you can do, especially with these uh, pump, you know, UV radiations, uh, uh, if, if, if you are able to put uh, a polarimeter, you can look at these signals. Yeah, that's a great question. You just totally set me up there, Roberto. So you can see this slide, right? <laughs> I don't think I stopped presenting, so you should still be able to see it? Yes, we see it. Okay, yeah. well, I'm, I'm part of a... Um, Midex uh, mission concept called Polestar that uh, if selected would be doing ultraviolet spectropolarimetry from about um, oh, about 120 nanometers down to just over 300 nanometers. And this cartoon graphic here is attempting to illustrate um, the kinds of things we hope to probe ranging from magnetism to rapid rotation, gravity darkening, uh, disks, and then binary companions, as well as the interstellar medium, because all this light has to, has to travel through the ISM, it's gas and dust. And um, the question was, how um, is it going to to um, uh, You're breaking out again, unfortunately. And the answer, the answer is, uh, you know, a little bit complicated, but basically there's a lot of things that seem to be going on with massive stars in different segments of the massive star population. But for example, um, some of it would just be spectroscopy, just getting much, much higher signal to noise in the kind of dynamic spectra that I showed earlier on. But what the beauty is of polarization is one, you can use the Zeeman effect, and that's a direct diagnostic of magnetism. Two, the linear polarization um, gives you a sense of deviation from spherical, and we know that we have that. So the degree of polarization, its amplitude and its variability would uh, be able to further help define where that's taking place. One of the most important things about linear polarization is anytime you have a position angle flip. It's just not something we got to go through. Yeah, and unfortunately, we missed the last uh, 20 seconds because it was coming chopped up again. Uh, are there any other questions? We're at the end of uh, all the time anyway. Sorry about that. Well, thanks, Rico, again. Yeah, I, I think that we need to sort out some te technical difficulties. <laughs> we'll have to have uh, a more streamlined way of uh, presenting uh, uh, 
you know contributions uh, especially from uh, you know uh, external visitors uh, maybe having a centralized uh, computer where we load up all these uh, presentations and make sure that we can uh, profit from uh, a good internet connection well thank you all well, thanks for, uh, during the difficulties i appreciate your <laughs> and, and patience thank you thank you